In this video I'm gonna show you how to create all of these traps, starting from simple spikes, going to fire traps, arrow traps and the spike block that will chase you around until it kills you. So let's go! First of all let's clean up the scripts folder a bit because in this video we're gonna create multiple new scripts so I want everything to be organized. Let's create a folder called player and drag in the player attack, player movement and projectile scripts in here. And the second folder that we're gonna create is gonna be called rooms and we're gonna drag the door script in there. The final folder that we're gonna create is gonna be called core and we're gonna put the camera controller script in there. Alright, we're done cleaning up, now let's open the enemies folder and create a new script called enemy damage. This script will have only one purpose and that is to damage the player once it touches it. So we're gonna need just one variable and that is a private float called damage. And let's serialize it so we can change the value in the editor. And the only function that we're gonna use here is on trigger enter 2D. We're gonna see if the enemy has collided specifically with the player by checking the collision.tag property. And if that's the case, we know that we can use the getComponent method to access the health of the player and decreasing it by using the takeDamage function and passing in the damage of this current enemy. And that's all the logic that we need to make the spikes work. So let's go back into Unity and create a new object called spikes. Make sure to put this object on the enemy layer and also assign the enemy tag to it. If you don't have either the enemy layer or the enemy tag, make sure to pause the video right here and create both of them and assign them to the object. This is important. When you're done, let's find the sprite that we need for the spikes. First of all, open the pixel adventure folder, then go into assets, traps, then spikes. And here you're gonna see it, it's called idle, so let's just take the sprite and drag it underneath the spikes object. And I know you can't see it for now, but let's increase the scale to 5, and in the sprite renderer let's change the sorting layer to foreground. I don't think two spikes will be enough for this, so I'm just gonna duplicate the sprite object and move the new object a bit to the right. As you can see, the new object ended up having the X position of 0.8. Now I'm gonna duplicate the object again to create a third one and give it an X position of minus 0.8 this time to maintain symmetry. Alright, 6 spikes is enough for me. So now let's select the spikes object and add the enemy damage script to it. Don't forget to change the damage value to be higher than 0 and add the box collider 2D to this object. Now press the edit collider button and let's change the size so it fits our spikes. Great, now the spikes are ready so I'll place them on the ground and after that don't forget to go to the prefabs folder. Now open the traps folder and finally drag the spikes in there so that they become a prefab. For now I'm gonna delete the saw and the health collectible objects because I want to test the spikes and they will just be a nuisance. And right here I realized that I forgot to set the collider on the spikes to be a trigger. So let's change it now because otherwise it's not gonna work. And after you press the check mark also don't forget to right click it and apply this change to all the prefabs. Finally we can press play and see if this works. As expected every time you touch the spikes your health decreases by 1. Which means that our first trap is working properly. Good job. Now we can move on to the second one. I'm gonna delete the spikes object from the hierarchy and create a new one called fire trap. As usually I'm gonna reset the position to 0 and assign the enemy tag and enemy layer to this object. Next let's add a sprite renderer component then go into pixel adventure, assets, traps, fire. Once you're in this folder take a look at the sprite that's called on. We will use this one once the trap is activated but for the idle state let's just take the off sprite for now. So select the fire trap object again and drag this sprite into the sprite field. And like you did with the other objects make sure to change the sorting layer to foreground and increase the scale up to 5. Now I'm gonna place it on the ground but leave it just visible enough so that the player doesn't step on it by accident. Once you're happy with the position, make sure to add a box collider 2D component to it, then go into scripts, enemies and create a new script called fire trap. Then select the fire trap object again, drag the script onto it, open it up and let's write some code. Alright, first of all I'm gonna put a header in here and I'm gonna call it fire trap timers. 
And underneath it I'm gonna put two float variables. The first one will be called activation delay and it will indicate how much time the trap needs to activate after the player has tapped on it. So for example if we put this value at 2 then if the player steps on the trap the fire will start after 2 seconds. The second variable that we'll need is called active time and this one will represent for how long the trap stays active after it has been activated. Alright, now let's create an update method and we'll also need one reference to the animator and another one to the sprite renderer. And as usually inside the awake method we're gonna grab these references using the get component method. Next we'll need two boolean variables, one called triggered and another one called active to define when the trap has been triggered or activated. Once that's done we can create an onTriggerEnter2D method and check if the trap has collided with the player. In here we basically have two scenarios. First if the trap hasn't been triggered then we need to trigger it. Second if the trap is active then we need to hurt the player. And you'll see how we trigger the trap in a second but for now let's handle the scenario where the player takes damage. So as we said if the trap is active we can actually grab a reference to the object that we collided with which in this case is the player and use get component to grab a reference to the health script of the player. From there on is just as simple as calling the take damage method. But we actually have a small issue here and that's the fact that we don't actually have a variable for the damage of a fire trap. So so let's create one. Let's call it damage, put it at the top of a script and serialize the field so we can change the value from unity. And once you're done just copy it and simply pass it to the take damage method. Now let's take care of how we trigger the fire trap. And for this purpose I'm actually gonna use an I enumerator because we have to deal with delays. And if the autocomplete is not working for you make sure to include the system.collections library. Once you are sure that you are using that library you can actually come back to this line and create a private I enumerator called activate fire trap. And now on line 29 we can actually replace the comment with the activate fire trap I enumerator. And every time you want to execute an I enumerator you have to make sure that you are using the start coroutine function. Otherwise your I enumerator will just do nothing and you will be scratching your head thinking where you got it wrong. Great, now let's actually see how we activate the fire trap. The first thing that we need to do is to tell the code that the trap has been triggered. And we do that to make sure that there aren't multiple activate fire trap coroutines running simultaneously. And that's the first step. The second step will be to use the yield return new wait for seconds to wait for a certain amount of time. And the amount of time will actually be the activation delay. We are doing this step just so that there is a pause between triggering the trap and activating it and that would give the player enough time to see that the trap has been triggered and try to avoid taking damage from it. When this period is over we can say that active equals true which means that the trap will be activated. Next we know that we want to wait for an amount of time that we defined as active time then deactivate the trap. And the deactivation process is quite simple, you just say active equals false and triggered equals false as well. Now let's go back into Unity for a bit and set up some parameters to make sure that this works. First of all make the box collider a trigger, then let's set up the damage and also the activation delay in active time. I'm gonna use a value of 2 seconds for both of those for now, but obviously you can tweak that later if you want to. And the final thing that we need to check here is if the object is set on the enemy tag and enemy layer. Right, so now the trap is functional but it will not have any visual effects or any animations and that's not what we want, so let's go back to the code and fix that. I think it would be a good idea to change the sprite of the trap to a red color once the player triggers it. In this way the player has a clear visual representation that something bad's about to happen. Once the trap is activated we can return the sprite color back to normal and that's because we're gonna have an animation of a fire playing already. If you go back into Unity, select the fire trap object and change its color to red, you'll see how the trap will look like when it's triggered. Now let's get on to the final part, which is making the animations work. So let's add an animator component to this object, then go into the animation traps folder and create a new folder for the fire trap. Once you're here create a new animator controller, call it firetrap and drag it onto the firetrap object. Now we need to open the animation window and if yours got lost just like mine you can actually reopen it by going into window animation. You can position it where you like it the most and once you're done press the create button and create a new animation called idle. 
Now press the red record button, open the sprite window, press on any other sprite that you want, then go back to the off version of the fire trap that we had in the beginning. Next let's create a new animation and call it activated. Press the red record button, go to the folder with the fire trap sprites and let's use these three that have fire enabled on them. If you can't find it just make sure to search the sprite that has the name on 16 by 32. Right, now let's go back to the animation. The second frame will be at 005 and we'll use the second sprite for that obviously and the third frame will be at 010 and we'll use the third sprite. And that's it for the fire trap animations. Now let's go into the animator window and set up the transitions. But first let's double click the activated animation and make sure that the loop time is enabled. Once that's done create a new transition from the idle animation to the activated one. And one in the opposite direction as well. Obviously we'll need a parameter to transition from one animation to another so let's go into the parameters window and create a new bool parameter. I'm gonna call mine activated with all lowercase letters and pay attention to how you spell this because you have to pass in the exact same name to the code otherwise it's not gonna work. Now press on the transition from idle to activated and make the condition be when activated is true. Next open the settings parameters, set all the parameters to zero and disable the exit time. Now let's select the transition from activated back to idle, set the condition to be when activated is false and use the same settings as we did for the previous transition. And the final step to make this trap work is to change this parameter from code, so let's go back into the fire trap script. First I'm gonna add a couple new comments and structure the code so that it's easier to understand. So, as we said previously, this is the part where we activate the trap. So let's use the animator reference to set the activated boolean to true here. Next I'm gonna put this comment here so that we understand that this is the part where we deactivate the trap, reset all the booleans and reset the animation back to idle as well. Once you're done typing the comment you can just copy paste the line from above and just change true to false to make the animator transition back to the idle animation. And the fire trap should be working now. Great, we can go back into Unity and press play. You'll see that as soon as you step on the fire trap it will trigger and turn red and after 2 seconds the fire will activate and it will hurt the player. So everything's looking great here. We can exit play mode and prefab the fire trap before we move on to the next one. So now let's open the prefabs folder, traps and just drag the fire trap in here. Now I'm gonna delete the object from the scene because we don't need it anymore and create a new object called arrow trap. As usually let's reset the position to 0 and change the scale to 5 for this object. Next let's select a gizmo so that the object is easier to find in the scene. Once that's done right click the arrow trap object and press create empty. And this is important because the new object should be a child of the arrow trap object otherwise it's not gonna work. Now I'm gonna call this object sprite and add a sprite renderer component to it. This will be the part of the arrow trap that launches arrows and I think I'm gonna use the same sprite that we used for the fire trap but just rotate it sideways. So go into the same folder and pick any of them that don't have fire enabled. Now change the sorting layer to foreground as we did with all the traps and rotate the object to minus 90 degrees on the Z axis. And you can rotate an object in two ways in Unity. You can press this button right here then drag the tooltip or you can change the value of the rotation manually from right here. Alright, when you're done with the rotation let's select the arrow trap parent object and drag it all the way onto the wall. And I know that I just made you change the scale of the arrow trap to 5 just a minute ago but I discovered that that's not gonna work and we need to change it back to 1. But instead we will select the sprite object which is the child and increase its scale up to 5. Again, sorry about this blunder, it's just a really long video. Let's continue. Go into the scripts enemies folder and create a new script called arrow trap. Naturally we will attach it to the arrow trap object and open up the script and start coding. The logic here will be very similar to the player attack script, with the exception that in this case it's not gonna shoot when we press the button, but rather on its own. So the first variable that we'll need is a float called attack cooldown and let's realize this field so we can tweak it from Unity. The next element that we'll need is a transform called firepoint, again, exactly like the player attack script. 
and an array of objects called fireballs, which will contain all the projectiles that the arrow trap can shoot. And the main function of this script will obviously be to shoot projectiles, so let's create a private void called attack. And because we want the attacks to happen with a certain delay, let's create another float called cooldown timer, and this one we're not gonna see realize. And when the arrow trap will shoot, we're gonna reset this cooldown timer to zero. Now we need to call the attack method from somewhere, and we're gonna do it from the update method. We're gonna check if the cooldown timer is bigger or equals to the attack cooldown that we selected, the arrow trap will attack immediately. Let's also not forget that we need to increment the cooldown timer on every frame, so let's just say cooldown timer plus equals time dot delta time. Now let's go back to the attack method. As you remember from the player attack script, every time we shoot we need to reset the position of a projectile to the fire point position. And secondly we need to set the direction of a projectile. For that purpose I'm gonna get the fireball object and use get component to grab a reference to the enemy projectile script. Which doesn't exist yet, so don't worry if this shows you an error, we're gonna fix it in a minute. So let's just type in set direction and pass in the sign of the transform local scale.x, which if you remember might be minus 1 or 1 depending on which direction the object is facing. Alright, next we need to create a private integer method called find fireball that will help us pull projectiles. Again, exactly like the player attack method. In here we're gonna have a for loop that's gonna cycle through all the fireballs and return the first one that is not active in the hierarchy. Make sure not to miss this exclamation mark right here. I see a lot of people making this mistake and then not being sure what went wrong with their script. And finally, if this method doesn't find any fireballs that are inactive, it's gonna return zero, which means that it's just gonna use the first fireball. Alright, now we need to replace these two zeros with the find fireball method, and I'm gonna show you a useful shortcut here. Select these two lines and press Ctrl H or Command H if you're on Mac, and you're gonna see this window pop up in the top right corner. In the first row you wanna type in what element do you wanna replace, which in our case is zero. And in the second row you wanna type in what you wanna replace it with, which in our case is find fireball and two round brackets. When you're done you want to press this button right here, but before you do that make sure that you only selected line 14 and 15, otherwise it's gonna replace all the zeros in this document with find fireball, which we don't want in this case. When you finally hit the button it's gonna replace everything and tell you how many replacements it made. I don't think it was very useful in this case because we could have changed it faster individually, but when you have a very big script and you want to replace a lot of elements this is actually gonna save you a ton of time. We still don't have an enemy projectile script and I'm sure that this error is bugging many of you so let's take care of it now. First let's create another child object of the arrow trap and we'll call this one firepoint. Let's select a gizmo so that we see where it is in the scene and drag it a bit to the side so that there is some distance between the arrow trap and the firepoint. Now select the arrow trap object and drag the firepoint object into the firepoint field. Next I'm gonna set the attack cooldown to 1 and create another child object called arrow holder that's gonna keep all the arrows that the arrow trap will shoot. Now make sure to right click the arrow holder, press create empty and finally create an arrow object. Drag it a bit to the side so that it's easier to see and let's select a sprite for it. I found this asset that has these 4 types of arrows and I'm gonna use the one with the red head. I'll put the link to the image in the description, so make sure to download it, then select it and choose the multiple sprite mode. Now open the sprite editor, maximize the window, press on the slice button and press slice again. And Unity will slice up all the sprites for you, so you should get these 12 sprites of arrows. Now you can exit this window, but make sure to press apply before that. To see how it looks let's select the arrow object, attach a sprite renderer to it and drag in the sprite of the arrow that you like the most. Obviously we need to change the layer to foreground to be able to see it and the arrow is gigantic. So let's tweak the scale. I think 0.125 is good enough but you can choose for yourself. When you're happy with the scale let's press add component and add the box glider 2D component and make it a trigger right away so we don't forget later. Also let's add a rigid body 2D component and change the mass, the linear drag, the angular drag and the gravity scale to zero. Next go into the tag dropdown and choose the enemy tag and also choose the enemy layer for this object. Right, now let's go into scripts, enemies and finally create a new script called enemy projectile. 
I wanted to choose the arrow object and drag the script onto it here, but it doesn't let me because we have an error as you can see. And here's another shortcut. You can actually double click this red text right here and it will take you directly to where the error is. You'll see that set direction is underlined, which in this case means that the enemy projectile script doesn't have a method called set direction, so let's implement that. Go back into Unity, open the enemy projectile script, delete all the useless code and create a public void called set direction that will take in a float argument called underscore direction. Save the script, go back into Unity and you'll see that the error is gone. Now we can select the arrow object and drag the enemy projectile script onto it. Before we continue with the arrows, let's open the enemy damage script and make a small change here. We're gonna change the on trigger enter 2D method and the damage variable from private to protected. And that's because we want to be able to access them from other scripts that will inherit from enemy damage. And I might hear you saying what does inherit mean and why are you using these fancy words all of a sudden. And here's where I want to take a couple minutes and explain the concept of inheritance. So the basic idea of inheritance is when a class gets all the properties of its parent class. But I don't think that's clear enough, so let's look at an example. Let's say that we have an enemy and a player script. For the purpose of this example, let's say that we want the enemy to be able to patrol a route to attack the player on site and to have a certain health that we can increase or decrease and when it reaches zero the enemy will die. Now let's look at the player script. We want the player to be able to move based on our input, we want the player to be able to shoot when we click the mouse and finally we also want the player to have a health component that acts the same way as the enemy's health. And if we are writing code without using inheritance we will just write all of this into two separate scripts and if some element is exactly the same, like in this case the health logic, we will just copy paste it, not a big deal, right? And if you notice, we actually did that in this video. We almost copied the entire code from the player attack to the arrow trap script. But this is actually a bad practice because what you could do instead is write the health script, put all the logic that you want the enemy and the player to inherit inside it, and then make the enemy and player class inherit from the health script. And this will give you two main advantages. First of all, your code is gonna be a lot more structured, and secondly, you're gonna have to write a lot less code. And the implementation of inheritance is quite simple, so you don't have to worry about that, but you just have to be strategic and think about which script should inherit what exactly. So let's see how this works in our project. Go back to Unity and open the enemy projectile script. If you remember at the beginning of a video we created a script called enemy damage, which damages the player every time it touches it. And that's exactly what we want the enemy projectile to do, so let's inherit from that script. And to make inheritance work you notice that I just replaced mono behavior with the script that we want to inherit from, which is enemy damage. So it's just that simple. And to see the effects, just go back into Unity and select the arrow. You're gonna see a damage field appear. But if you actually go back into the enemy projectile script, you see that we don't have a damage variable, so how is that possible? And the answer is quite simple, that's because the enemy damage script has the damage variable. And because the enemy projectile inherits from enemy damage, it will also get the same variable. Alright, now let's get the enemy projectile to move. And also let's open the projectile script because we're gonna copy some of the code from here. The first thing that we want to copy from here is the speed variable. And now let's create a new float variable called reset time. And the purpose of this variable will be to deactivate the object after a certain period of time. So that's why we'll need another float variable called lifetime. After playing around with the code for a bit, I found that we can simplify it by removing the underscore direction parameter. So let's do that. And since we're not passing in a direction anymore, it makes more sense to change the name of a method to activate projectile. After you've done that, make sure to go to the arrow trap script, change the name of a method here as well, and remove the parameter that you pass in. The first thing we do when we activate the projectile will be to reset the lifetime to zero. And next we'll activate the projectile by saying gameObject.setActive true. I know you see false on the screen right now, but that's actually my mistake. I'm gonna come back to it in a minute, but you can change it to true right now. Okay, let's move on. Now we need to create an update method. The first thing that we need to do in here is calculate the movement speed, which will just be equal to its speed multiplied by time.delta time to make it frame rate independent. And then we'll just use transform.translate to move the projectile on the x-axis. 
Another thing that we need to do here is increment the lifetime variable on every frame and once it's bigger than the reset time we need to deactivate the game object. Great, we're almost ready to test this. The final thing that we need to do here is create an onTrigger enter 2 d method and let's leave it empty for now. Now let's go back into Unity, select the arrow object and assign all the variables. I'm gonna set the damage to 1, the speed to 5 and the reset time also to 5. Now let's make this arrow a prefab, so let's just open prefab projectiles folder and drag it in. Once you have the prefab in the folder you can select it from the project menu and then press this check mark to make sure it's deactivated. Now I'm gonna reset the position of the object to 0 and duplicate it 9 times so that we have 10 arrows. Now we can select the arrow trap object, lock it in by pressing this small button in the top right corner and drag all the arrows into the fireballs array. Now that I'm looking at it I don't think fireballs is a good name for this variable so let's open the arrow trap script and fix that real quick. I'm gonna rename fireballs to arrows because that's what we actually have in there and then make sure to replace all the references in this script. Then I'm also gonna rename the find fireball method to find arrow, that seems more appropriate. Now let's go back into Unity and unfortunately because we renamed the fireballs variables all the references to the arrows were lost so we have to drag them in again. And now I'm gonna open the enemy projectile script and change this false value to true. Make sure to do the same if you didn't do it earlier in the video. And finally we can return to Unity, press play and see how the arrow trap works. As you can see the arrows are flying in the right direction and if you would turn the trap around it will still work correctly. But the problem that we do have is that the arrows are not deactivating after they hit something, unlike our player's fireballs. Also I think the arrows are moving too slowly, so I'm gonna select one arrow object, open the prefab and change the speed to 10. Now let's fix the issue with deactivating the arrows. Open the enemy projectile script again, and inside the onTrigger enter 2 d method let's just say gameObject.setActive false, which will deactivate the projectile once it hits another collider. Doesn't matter what it is, it can be the player, the wall or anything else. Great, but before we move on we have an issue to fix. You might have noticed that the onTrigger enter 2 d method is underlined by Visual Studio. And that's because both the enemy projectile script and the enemy damage script, which is its parent, have this method. In this case the code from the enemy damage script, which is the parent, is not gonna get executed. Which means that whenever the enemy arrow will hit the player, it will deactivate but not deal any damage. And that's not what we want. So we gotta find a way to solve it. And the fix is actually very easy, it's just one line of code. So we're gonna write base, on trigger enter 2D, collision. In C Sharp base is a keyword that lets you automatically access the parent script. So when we write this line what we actually mean is go to the enemy damage script and make sure to call the on trigger enter 2D method first. Which as we said previously is gonna check if there is a collision with the player and if there is the player will be hurt. And once that's done we can deactivate the arrow. And you might notice that the on trigger enter 2D method is still highlighted by Visual Studio but you can safely ignore it, you're not gonna have an issue with it anymore. So let's go back and to Unity and finally enjoy getting shot by arrows. Everything's looking good. As you can see, if the player touches the arrow and he's not invincible, he's gonna get hurt. And the arrows deactivate after touching the player or the wall. And we can finally exit play mode, go into the prefabs traps folder and drag in the arrow trap object. Now we can move on to the final trap of this video. Let's delete the arrow trap object and create a new one called spike head. Reset all the positions to zero as we usually do and add a sprite renderer component. Now let's go into the pixel adventure folder, assets, traps and find a folder called spike head. And we're gonna use the idle sprite from this folder. So select the spike head object, drag it in and change the sorting layer to foreground. Let's also change the scale to 5 maybe? I don't know, that seems a bit too much but we can change it later. And next we're gonna need a box collider 2D component. Then let's edit the collider because the bounds are way too big now. Once you're done with that let's add a rigid body 2D component, make the collider a trigger and go into the rigid body settings and under constraints freeze the rotation. And the final thing here is to change the mass, the linear drag, the angular drag and the gravity scale to zero. When you're finished with this, go into the scripts enemies folder and create a new script called spikehead. Naturally we're gonna attach it to the spikehead object and open it up. 
Because I want the spike head to hurt the player on contact, I'm gonna make it inherit from enemy damage, just like the enemy projectiles. The first variable that we'll need here is a private vector free called destination. And when the spike head will detect the player, we will store the player's position inside this variable. Next we'll need an update method, and inside it we're gonna use transform.translate to move the spike head towards the destination that we just mentioned. And we're gonna multiply that destination by time.delta time and by a speed variable that we don't yet have but we will create right now. Let's serialize this field so we can tweak it from Unity and then create another private float variable called range which will represent how far away the spike head will be able to see. The next variable that we'll need is a private boolean called attacking so that we can tell the code when the spike head is attacking the player and when it's not. And inside the update method we're gonna say if the spike head is attacking then move him to his final destination. If not, don't do anything. Moving on to the next step, which will be to introduce a bit of a delay between the attacks. For this purpose we're gonna need two float variables. The first one called check delay, and let's realize this one. And the second one called check timer. Now let's go back to the update method. When the spike head will not be attacking, we will increment the check timer by time.delta time. And whenever the check timer will be bigger than the check delay, we're gonna check if the spike head sees the player. And for that exact purpose, we're gonna create a new private void called check for player. In here, I wanna create a behavior that's fairly similar to the Spelunky 2's crash traps from the temple level, meaning that the block will check for the player in four cardinal direction, and when it sees him, it's gonna move in that direction. But before we move into that, we need a method that's gonna calculate all four directions. So first, let's create a private void called calculate directions. And to store all of these directions, we will need a new array of vectors called directions. And pay attention that when I create it, I put the number four in the square brackets, which means that it's gonna have only four elements, not more and not less. So now let's go back to the calculate directions method and calculate the first one. You see that I typed in direction 0, and that's because the first element inside an array is always marked with 0, not 1. As for the value of this vector, I'm gonna use transform.right, which contains the right direction relative to this object's position. And because we want the spike head only to see at a limited range, we need to multiply this vector by the range variable. And this is the first direction, which you might have figured out is the right direction. Now let's calculate the left one. Duplicate this row and change the index to 1, because this will be the second direction. Now simply put a minus in front of transform.right, and that's it, this is the left direction. Moving on to the third one, which will be the upper direction. First of all, let's remove the minus, then change transform.right to transform.up. And the final direction, which will point down, will be exactly the same, but with a minus in front. Now, we could use this function to calculate the directions inside the update method, but that would be illogical and bad for the performance, so let's just do it only when the spike head checks for the player. And the next step will be to iterate through all four directions using a for loop. And inside the for loop we're gonna use debug.trawArray with a starting point at transform.position. The second parameter is the direction of array, and for this one we're gonna use directions square brackets i. And the third parameter is the color of array, and for this one let's just use color.red. Now let's go back into Unity, press play, select the spike head object and change the range variable to something different than 0. Let's say 10 for now. And immediately you're gonna see four red lines being drawn in four different directions. You can change the range if you want to play around with it, but the general idea is that as soon as the player touches one of these lines, the spike head is going to charge towards you. If you don't see the lines or any other gizmos, make sure to press this small button right here. Alright, now let's exit play mode and I'm going to set the range to 8 and the check delay to 0.25 for now. Now let's get back to the code. To actually detect the player, we're going to use ray casting. So let's create a new raycast hit to the variable called hit. And to detect the hit, we're gonna use physics2d.raycast with an origin point at transform.position. And it will go into all four directions consecutively at a distance determined by the range variable. And finally, let's use a layer mask only to detect the collisions with the player and nothing else. 
And for that purpose I'm gonna type in player layer here. And this variable doesn't exist for now, so let's go to the top of the script and create it. Alright, you'll see that the error is gone now, so we can continue. Next up we wanna check if the hit collider is not null, which means that the spike head detected the player and the spike head is not attacking. Then we want to make the attacking variable true and the destination will be equal to the direction in which we found the player. And the final thing to do here is to reset the check timer to zero. Moving on, the next method that we'll need here is non-trigger enter 2D method to handle collisions. And because this script inherits from enemy damage, we need to make sure to call the method from the base script to damage the player on contact. Other than that, we also need to make sure that the spike head stops once it hits something, otherwise it's gonna keep going infinitely. And for that purpose, let's create a new private void called stop. In here, the first thing that we wanna say is that the destination equals to the transform's current position. If you remember, when this object is attacking, it's always moving towards its destination. But if the destination is the current position, then the object will just stop. And the next thing here is to make the attacking variable equal to false. Now we can just call this method inside onTriggerEnter2D to make the spike head stop. The next step will be to add an onEnable method. And just to remind you, onEnable gets called every time the object is activated, and that's gonna be important a bit later on. And inside onEnable we wanna call the stop method, just to make sure that the object starts in an idle position and doesn't go crazy and try to attack us right away. Now I'll clean up and organize the code a bit and add a header just so it looks better in the editor. Now let's go back into Unity, select the spike head object, assign a damage of 1, a speed of 1, and let's change the range to 16 just to see how it works. I'm also gonna increase the check delay to 1 just to make it a bit easier to dodge and finally assign the player layer. And now we can test it, but before you hit play, just make sure to select the player object and see if it's assigned to the player layer. So as soon as you touch one of these four direction lines, the spike head will charge in that direction and it will start chasing you pretty aggressively after that. In fact, it might be a bit too aggressive because you see I went to the next room and it followed me in there and that's not what we want, that would make the game a bit too difficult for the player. So this is the last thing that we want to do in this video. We want to make sure that we reset the traps as soon as we leave the room. But before we do that, let's exit play mode, go into the prefabs traps folder and drag the spike head object in there. Great, now let's select the door object and press on the door script once to go to the scripts rooms folder. In here, let's create a new script called room. Then choose the room1 object, attach the script to it and open it up. In this script, we're gonna have an array of game objects where we're gonna store all the enemies. Then we will need an array of vector frees that will contain the initial position of all the enemies. Now let's create an awake method and the first thing that we'll do here is save the initial position of all the enemies. And this will be a two step process. First of all we want to make sure that inside the initial position array we have enough space for the positions of all the enemies. So we're gonna say that the initial position equals to a new vector free array with the same length as the array of enemies. And the second part of this will be to create a for loop that will iterate through all the enemy objects and save the position of our transform inside the initial position array. Just as a safeguard, let's add an if statement that checks if the enemy object is not null. Now let's go back into Unity and I'll show you a situation in which this can happen. If you have the room object selected, you should see the enemies array on the right. So let's say for example that you change the size of your array but you forget to assign the objects. Or let's say that you did assign the objects but you deleted one of them by accident. In this case you're gonna get a null reference exception. So it's a good practice just to check if the object is null or not before trying to reference it. Alright, back to our room script. Now we'll need a public void called activate room that will take in a boolean parameter called underscore status. And depending on the value of this parameter, we will be either activating or deactivating all the enemies in this room. To save some time, you can just copy paste the for loop from above. But instead of saving the position of the enemy this time, we're gonna get the enemy with the index i, and we're gonna use set active to either activate or deactivate it. After we've done that, we wanna take the same object and reset its position to be exactly like the initial position. 
So we're kind of reversing the logic that we had in the awake function. In there we took the transforms position and assigned it to the initial position and in here we are taking the initial position and assigning it to the transforms position. Now we need to call this method from somewhere and for that purpose let's open the door script. Inside the on trigger enter 2D method of this script, in the part where we move the camera to the next room, let's get the next room object, use get component to access the room script, and call the activate room method with a true parameter. This means that we are going to activate the enemies inside the room that we are entering. But we also need to deactivate the enemies from the room which we are exiting. So let's copy this line, replace next room with previous room, and replace true with false. Now let's handle the opposite scenario, in which we are moving to the previous room. In this case we want to copy line 22 and just replace false with true. Now let's copy line 21 and just replace true with false so that we deactivate the enemies inside the next room object. Awesome, this was the last line of code that we have to write in this episode. So now let's go back to Unity. So now let's select the room 2 object and add the room script to it. Since I don't have any enemies inside room 2, I can leave the enemies array empty. But inside room 1 we need to assign the spike head. So let's drag it underneath room 1 inside the hierarchy. Then select the room 1 object and drag the spike head inside the enemies array. And if you have empty elements inside the enemies array like I do here, make sure to select them, then press the minus button to remove them. And finally we can press play and see how everything works. Pay attention that the spike head will go down, then as soon as we enter the new room is gonna be deactivated. When you come back to the previous room you'll see that the spike head is at the initial position. And that's all I've got for this episode. This one was really hard to make so thanks a lot for watching and making it this far. And finally I wanna give a huge shout out to all of our Patreons. Bo Gray, Jason Ledbetter and Akister, thank you, you're all amazing. And if you want to help the channel too and get early access to the videos, consider supporting me on Patreon. That's it, go make some games now.